Welcome everyone. Um, I believe that I am live now. So uh, uh, let me start with uh, telling you that my name is Anna Draniewicz. Uh, some of you might already know it because you are coming back uh, day by day, but we might have some new people's, uh, people and I have to repeat all of the informations uh, over and over again. So if you already joined us before, I'm sorry, but you will have to hear it. Uh, well, three more times uh, today, tomorrow and after tomorrow. So first of all, um, I would like to um, ask you to use the Q&A uh, uh, box at the bottom of the screen uh, and ask your questions about the film or about the subject down there during the, this event. If you cannot see it right now, uh, then you have to move your mouse and you will see the Q&A uh, button right there. So that's, uh, that's one thing. Now, if you have some questions after this event is finished, um, you may email me and I'm gonna put my email into the chat right now. Uh, you will need to copy it before the event is over though because after we close this window, it will disappear. Uh, so on your side, you can email me whenever uh, um, I will reply. If not um, during the retrospective, then surely after, which means next week. Uh, but I will also email you when the retrospective is over. I will send you a short survey with just a few simple questions. And if you join us more than once, more, for more than one film, you might get it a few times, uh, but you will only have to fill it in once and just tick which films you have seen, either with us or anywhere else um, ever, uh, because the questions are more about the films uh, itself than the retrospective. So that's one thing. Um, Another thing I, I should mention is the fact that we have the license for those films for the USA. So uh, if you are in the US, you, you can access them and watch them with us. Mm, if you are outside the US and you are a Polish speaker, you can easily find them online, other places like YouTube, uh, and you can just refresh your memory uh, this, this way. Uh, now, if you um, missed one of the films that you wanted to see but you couldn't or you want to review the film you already seen, uh, then uh, contact me and I can give you the link again. Um, so you can also use that email for that. Um, okay, so uh, this um, whole event, the retrospective of Polish um, cult comedies from communist times, uh, is part of my research. Uh, about uh, how um, humor can be used as a, a tool of fight against the regime. Um, as George Orwell wrote, every joke is a tiny revolution. However, various academics from the field of humor studies uh, disagree whether humor is a tool of fight with uh, the regime, a form of peaceful protest, or merely a safety belt. According to the relief theory of humor, it can play a therapeutic and cathartic role. Uh, Sigmund Freud believed that it allows people to express forbidden thoughts and therefore is a coping mechanism. In Soviet bloc, the laughter was giving people the feeling of freedom. It helped integrate and it helped bond forming. And thanks to that, people were able to see that they are not alone, start organizing and fighting against the regime. So the films that we are showing here um, are uh, either, well, they have to Fill, fulfill two uh, requirements. They have to be uh, about communist times and they have to be uh, a cult comedy, which means they have to have a status which um, uh, I don't decide uh, about or what any other singular person cannot decide which film is a cult film. It only happens um, when a group, a big group of people, usually a generation, decides that the film is cult. Um, and uh, in Poland, the uh, world cult film became so popular that distributors uh, in the 2000s, uh, you know, when, when old cult films became popular from the communist times, they started to abuse the word. They would release a comedy uh, and they would say it's a cult comedy, using the word cult uh, for the equivalent of very funny. That's not the case though. I mean, you cannot decide uh, that the film will be cult. It takes time. It takes at least a decade or, or more. And it's more than one person who decides. And uh, the funny thing about cult uh, films in general 
uh, is that it's first of all they are quite niche usually um, people didn't really talk about them much academics didn't look at them for a while uh, so it's quite new uh, thing and the um, interesting thing is, is that um, in post-communist countries, cult films are usually comedies. But in the West, they are usually um, science fiction or horrors. So that's the difference. Obviously, in general, not all of them, but mostly. So that's the difference between cult films in the West and in the East. So today's uh, film um, is called The um, Emergency Exit, and it's by uh, Roman Zawuski. The film uh, lasts one hour and a half. Um, I will shortly give you the link and then uh, also the password. So it will appear in the chat and you have to click on the link and then put the password in. Just copy it from, from the chat or remember it if you can. Um, and then you will go uh, and watch the film yourself um, in another window. Please don't close this uh, Zoom uh, meeting at that time. We will not be able to hear you or, or see you, so you don't have to worry about that. Just leave it open. And when you finish watching the film, just come back to Zoom at 8 p.m. Eastern time, and we will start uh, Q&A. Now, we, we will give you a little bit more time than just one hour and a half uh, for two reasons. One is that you can, during the film, uh, stop when you see a scene that surprised you or you have question about and then you can just jump to this window go to the Q&A put that question in and then go back and finish watching the film uh, you can also use that uh, for going back a little bit if you for example miss a subtitle uh, and you just want to see again or stop it for a minute so you will have a little bit more time uh, just to play with the film a little bit. So I hope that will be helpful because I know some people are not used to subtitles. Um, so this film uh, by Roman Zawuski, as I mentioned, uh, is a little bit different from all the others that we, are sh we have shown because it's um, more uh, like comedy of the manners. Uh, so it's about the society, uh, it's about uh, social uh, issues, and uh, politics is just like a background uh, more. Um, but it is making fun of the system as the only film uh, by this director. He made uh, uh, more comedies um, and they were all something we would call uh, provincial satires. So they would usually make fun from the fact that the, from the differences between the people from the city, big city and the little village. Um, and uh, he actually made uh, many more famous comedies who are even maybe uh, more famous than, than this one, even though this is a cult comedy, and which, again, another thing to prove that a film is a cult uh, film is the fact that people, the fan base, is using the quotes. And many quotes from this film are used in an in a, um, everyday language. So that is the, uh, the reason why we call it a cult comedy. Uh, but this um, director um, made also uh, many more films about the socialist issues. So this one is a, a rom-com and most of his films in a way were about um, relationships uh, and uh, feelings and, and he was uh, concentrating on, on love stories, let's say. Well, maybe twisted love stories sometimes, as I will prove in a second. Uh, because I want to mention three uh, other films that he made, very famous ones. So uh, the first one was called Kogel Mogel, and that is um, um, a thing <laughs> that we used to make in Poland. It's, it's known in other countries too, um, but it's, um, it's a yolk with sugar, mixed with sugar. And you can add some other things to that, but not necessary. So abroad, it's more known as uh, alcohol. Uh, for example, eggnog in England or uh, zabayone in Italy. Um, so they are based on the egg, egg yolk and uh, sugar. Um, but in Poland, we would just treat it as a dessert, really. Uh, especially children liked it a lot. Uh, chocolate was hard to get. Even uh, sweets, any sweets was hard to get in communist times. Uh, we had something, for example, called uh, 
uh, chocolate-like uh, thing, product. <laughs> so it wasn't pure chocolate, it was just something brownish and very sweet. Uh, I don't even want to try to remember what was in it, but it was not chocolate. There was no coca in it probably at all. Um, so this uh, Kogel Mogel was a very popular thing for children. It was easy. Uh, they could just ask their parents if they could have one egg and a little bit of sugar. They would have to mix it themselves. And it was a lot of fun to make Kogel Mogel. But the title of the film, the Kogel Mogel, was really just meaning a mixture of different things, of problems or uh, misunderstandings, because this film is full of that. That's why the title, uh, that's where the title comes from. Uh, and then the second part was made as well because it was so popular that he made Kogel Mogel 2 or Galimatias. Uh, and again, it was about this, it, it was mostly about the young girl from the village who moves to the city and studies and wants to fulfill, um, you know, um, her um, dream. Uh, so in a way that is similar to the emergency exit today because uh, it's talking uh, about uh, her love life uh, as well. And then the most, the other fam most famous film by um, Roman Zawuski is Oh Carol. In translation, it will be Oh Charles because Carol is a masculine name in Polish and is translated to Charles. And that was an erotic comedy, uh, very light, <laughs> nothing, you know, nothing to, um, bad uh, or weird, except for the fact that it was about a man, Carol or Charles, who would have, a, well, he was ladies man, he was a womanizer, and he would have affairs with two women at the same time, while he was married as well. So when he, his wife finds out, uh, she actually finds the, the lovers of his wife, uh, of, his, of her husband, and she invites them to her house and they start kind of a commune. And so they share the husband and uh, he cannot take it. It's too much for him. He's having more affairs outside. In the end, he, he runs away. And when he comes back, he finds out uh, his wife alone. Uh, all the ladies are gone. But then he realized that he's not alone with her because now she found herself two more men. So that was her revenge. So as you can see, that's quite unusual, I think, uh, even for Polish cinema to have a comedy like that. It was very popular. It was, again, very light, uh, you know, and this film that we're going to watch as well will be nothing like uh, Barea films that we've been watching for the last uh, few days. Uh, it will be very, very um, comedy-like uh, because in Barea we would have a lot of um, intelligent jokes or... Um, you know, you, you have to have some knowledge of some things to understand what's happening. In this one, that will not be the case at all. Uh, but there will be a lot of jokes about the system. Uh, I think they will be quite straightforward, so there shouldn't be any problem uh, with you uh, with understanding them. Uh, because, you know, it will be just showing uh, how the system uh, in the 80s uh, uh, looked like. How... Um, hypocrisy of the system by then uh, was uh, in everywhere uh, life. Uh, briberies, um, pretending, you know, in front of other people, uh, this communist morality, uh, all of those things uh, will be shown in a very uh, distorted mirror uh, and in a, in a funny way. So, um, I really think that you will enjoy this one because, as I said, it will be it will be much much different, the lightest of all of them in a way, and also the last one that will show uh, life in Poland, Poland in communism as such, because uh, tomorrow and after tomorrow, Mahulski's films will be showing totalitarian systems, but dressed up as something else, either science fiction or, or uh, fairy tale. So it will not be happening in a Polish reality anymore. So this is the last one really, and it captures uh, very well the 80s. It's also about this um, generational gap. So we have a, a couple, a married couple. Um, the main protagonist is a woman who, uh, who is a, like a leader of the village. She's also a party leader in that village. So she has the power 
uh, together with the militiamen. <laughs> Um, and there, uh, in this uh, film, we also see her um, contact or connection uh, or lack of it with the church. And I would like to find, uh, mention right now a little bit about the Catholic, the situation of Catholic church in, in uh, Poland. We didn't have uh, much uh, really occasions to talk about it earlier because that was not subjects of our films. But we, in this film, we have a, a priest. And um, we can also see this difference between the generation of the parents um, who um, would believe in the system or be party members or wouldn't believe but would be party members because it was just easier. And then the young people who would um, revolt against. And maybe not necessary because the, the, of the system itself, just because it was their parents' uh, thing, right? So they would revolt against it. And what happened in the 80s was also the fact that Pol Polish youth uh, would turn to the church. Not only the youth, everybody would turn to the church because the church became um, a, a power that could fight communism and, and did in, in Poland. Situation of a church of a Catholic church in Poland was a little bit different than other countries. In the 50s, obviously, uh, they were trying to 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 break uh, the, the the church. They would take their um, uh, both lands and buildings away from them and give it to the people. Uh, obviously, religion was the opium from the masses for the masses, so it was not uh, welcome in the communist country. But the church survived, first by signing an agreement with communism that uh, they will just like a kind of non-aggression uh, agreement, which meant that the, the church will not be openly fighting communism and, and telling people to vote, for example, against. At the very beginning, we still had elections that kind of made sense. Later, those elections were all fake, really. Um, but then in the 50s, the, the communists decided to uh, attack the church and um, Cardinal Stefan Wyszyński, who was the, um, the cardinal of, of Poland back then, uh, the primate, he was actually um, detained uh, for three years in the, from 1953 to 1956. And uh, uh, after that, there was another agreement, like uh, a little bit change that was actually better for the church. So the church was um, not forbidden, like in Russia. If you were a party member, you still shouldn't go. You shouldn't take uh, your uh, you know, wedding in the church. You shouldn't baptize your children, etc. cetera. Uh, theoretically, you in practice probably would <laughs> in, in, uh, in secret, uh, but it was not at least uh, completely forbidden. And with time, and especially in the 80s, when this film is happening, the church became um, really powerful. Um, the, the church would have connections with the West. All the help and aid for Polish people was coming through the church, the packages uh, that were distributed later between the people who needed them. Um, oh yeah, somebody just mentioned election of Polish Pop was also obviously a very important part of that um, role of the church. When Pope uh, came to Poland, uh, exactly, <laughs> so you can all see it probably. Uh, when he came and, and Solidarity, um, there was still like developing kind of, well, actually Solidarity was the outcome of his uh, first visit probably because people saw how many of them there are uh, and they felt that the power in the number. So they started to organize themselves more. And in the 80s, uh, you would have something called Oasis, Oaza, and that was an organization which would um, attract young people. Um, and a lot of them, that was their form of revolt and rebel uh, against this, uh, you know, uh, communist times of their parents and the communist system of their parents as they saw it. Uh, also, um, punk rock music was very popular, no future. Uh, all those symbols. Uh, so people would go either to punk rock or the religious Catholic uh, organizations or both. Um, uh, and in this film, we see that the daughter of the, um, the party leader in that village, uh, she actually goes to church and the, the, the lady the, in charge is not happy with that, obviously. 
and in the end, uh, this, yeah, the two young people, the protagonists of this film, uh, will actually revolt uh, against that um, lady who, who, who starts it all. She actually kind of brings it all, all uh, on herself, as, as you will see. She, she starts uh, the um, avalanche of uh, um, events and then she cannot stop it anymore. But it's all very light, as I mentioned, don't worry, <laughs> there will be no, uh, no um, very serious uh, subjects really uh, mentioned here. And if they will, they will be, uh, they will be treated in a very, very light way. Uh, and going back to the church for a second as well, I also wanted to mention that um, by the 80s, uh, you, we would have um, some kind of uh, clubs for young people, we, not only um, uh, religion classes, so children after school once a week usually would go to the church. Every church would have a, a building uh, where priests would live, but also there would be classes there. So they usually had a bigger building that they needed just for themselves and they would teach religion. Um, and that was obviously a, a choice. I mean, you could send your children to religion classes or not, uh, but a lot of people did. Uh, remember that um, Poland was very, very Catholic, and also it was a form of protest uh, against the party. Um, and those uh, places also used in the, were used in the evening by, for, by young people as film clubs, for example. They would show when VHS cassettes were already you know, popular, they would show films that were forbidden uh, in the communist times. And the advertisement would be on the, during the mass. Uh, the, the priest would say what day, what film will be shown. So that was all uh, kind of like the second circulation uh, uh, of films um, that would be illegal in a way. But, you know, as I said, the system was getting weaker and weaker every decade. And they just, in the 80s, uh, they were just not uh, able to really suppress it anymore. Um, and also, you know, the 80s was uh, the time when after 1981, the martial law, the spirit of the um, people was crushed uh, a little bit. So after the solidarity movement was legalized, uh, and then we had the martial law and curfew for like two years, uh, people just kind of lost hope. So um, it was not un until 1989 uh, when it kind of, they kind of reawake. It was a little bit like they were asleep during the time. They kind of uh, agreed to what's happening, I guess. Um, it was a very, very weird time. So this film uh, is exactly happening uh, in, in those times. Uh, and it shows how, how they were uh, just trying to live their life, I guess. Um, uh, and yeah, and, and just not, you know, um, pay too much attention to, 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 to the politics, but also I guess it was just uh, some time to kind of, uh, you know, recharge uh, your batteries and get ready. Uh, and then in election in 1989, uh, yeah, we finally changed the system. Okay, um, uh, I will finish uh, for now. I will now give you the link to the film. So it will appear right there in the chat right now. You just have to click on it, you don't have to copy it, but it might help to copy the password. So I'm also giving you the password right now. And we have uh, one hour and 35 minutes before the Q&A. So I will see you back here in exactly one hour and 25 minutes. Thank you. I hope you like the film. Um, as I mentioned, it was a little bit different. Uh, this director, Roman Zawuski, uh, was a um, comedy director. He only make, made uh, comedies, uh, but he actually stopped making them in 1994 and haven't since then. He's still alive, but he kind of retired from the directing. He was born in uh, 19... Uh, 36, which makes him 84 uh, four years old uh, right now. And he was born in a, um, a place called Lida, which was uh, in Poland before the war, because 1936 was obviously before the Second World War, but now is in Belarus. 
and that's very often the case. Um, mm, uh, I mean, Polish borders uh, are moving uh, a lot over the centuries. Um, so a part of Poland that was, um, uh, or, or part of the lands there were Polish before the Second World War uh, were not after. Uh, the Poland changed completely, moved a little bit to the west, so we lost some eastern parts to, to, to Russia and uh, gained some German parts. Um, so yeah, he was not, you know, Belarus is a country to, to which is not really uh, easy to travel uh, right now. Uh, but yeah, he, he made comedies only, he's not very um, famous abroad, uh, but his comedies are quite famous in Poland, and this one we shown because of the um, satire on the system, of the communist system. And I hope you could have, you could see it uh, very well in this film. So first of all, we have the um, unexpected visit by a um, party leader, probably from the um, nearby town, uh, who's coming, and. Uh, in the end, we find out he's not coming to check uh, how how the um, the leader of the village is doing. Uh, this this lady, who's the protagonist of the film, he's coming uh, to the priest. The priest is a, a healer. He he heals people uh, for free. He doesn't take money back. If he did, they could stop him. But because he doesn't, uh, there's nothing they can do about it. And the, the, the protagonist, uh, the lady, the, let's call her the leader, uh, Mrs. Leader, uh, she actually uh, wants to cover the fact that the priest is healing people uh, because she thinks it will look bad on her uh, when, the, um, when the party uh, members come to visit. But in the end, it's actually the opposite. They are ex they're exactly for that reason, and they don't really care about her and the other uh, two men. The three of them uh, represent the power uh, in the village. So the other one is her co-worker, and then the third one is the uh, militia man. So in this film, we see a lot of uh, hypocrisy. Uh, everything is to show off, right? Everything has to look uh, good outside but it doesn't matter what really is happening at the, at the back side, uh, at the back. <laughs> um, and that was, that was the, the case very often. Uh, everything, as we said before, was based on propaganda and then uh, every, everything was based on lies. Um, and that could be either uh, in a way we watched in Barea films when we had uh, protagonists who would just cheat everybody uh, or it could be, as in this case, this woman, she's not as bad as cynical and uh, using people um, for her or gain as much as, as Barea's um, uh, protagonist in the last few films we've watched. She at least is paying uh, for, for covering uh, the biggest shame that could happen to her. Because the, the daughter uh, gets pregnant and obviously she's not married, so that would make her a single mother and the child would become a bastard. Now this is obviously the worst thing that could happen uh, to this poor woman. Uh, she thinks that having a daughter who's divorced is better than having a daughter who's not married. So you can see this uh, communist morality uh, here, um, the paradox uh, of it in a way we could say because uh, obviously, according to the um, Catholic religion, uh, you are not uh, supposed to have children uh, outside marriage. So even though she is not Catholic herself, she cares a lot about how people see her. And in a small village like that, uh, gossiping was very popular. So she had to pretend her reputation was the most important thing for her, more important than her family, even her daughter herself. So she is trying to do anything she can to keep her good name. Uh, and that in her uh, imagination means that if she pays somebody to marry her daughter and then divorce her like three months later, that will look better than no wedding and a child. Uh, so it's very, very weird in a way if you think about it. Uh, but back then that would make sense. 
in communist getting divorced was not a problem was not seen bad because obviously before in catholic poland it would uh, but for communist uh, wedding um, divorce was was not a problem so in the end the gentleman who decides to marry her daughter doesn't want to divorce her they fall in love uh, and they decide that they will uh, stay together what happens in a way is that this poor woman is losing her power over her family completely because of this man that she lets into her house because her daughter stops listening to her and she says it's our you know issue if we want to get divorced or not we are married and that's it you have nothing to say anymore and then the only person who will get divorced is probably her husband uh, he's been always a very um, uh, attached to the neighbor and the neighbor obviously liked him as well very much and during the wedding when they had some vodka some alcohol that um, well make them closer uh, to each other so we can imagine that in the end there will be a divorce but of a completely different uh, couple so she's losing power over her, her husband as well completely which obviously at the beginning she has complete power over and that symbolized the power that the party and the communists, the party um, had over Poland. So we, we read in every film back then, we would read the political meanings and look, looks for symbols like that. So don't be surprised. Um, yeah, so in this case, uh, she was representing at the end of communism in a way. Um, uh, so yeah, the, the bribery is another thing of that part of that, uh, um, you know, communism facade that is not really weird, uh, real. When she um, she gets an um, anonymous letter saying that uh, somebody knows her um, uh, son to be son-in-law to be uh, actually uh, was in the prison because that's what uh, they find a piece of paper. They find proofs that he was in prison. He was released from prison. So uh, she sends her husband to pay the, uh, the bribe because she says uh, that um, authority doesn't bribe, it's the other way around. So she's used to getting bribes, but not uh, paying to somebody else. So in this film, we have a lot of this little um, connections between people, how they help each other, how they try to keep everything looking good. When they find out that the, um, the party leaders might be coming visiting, they will just drive around the village and look at places that don't look very well and decide what to do about it. So because there's always a line waiting for the um, meat shop uh, and the line is there because there is no meat, uh, but you always hope there will be, so you wait. So she decides they're gonna close it completely uh, so the only way to stop people queuing for uh, for meat is to close the shop, uh, not bring in the meat, right? That's obviously not the possibility. Uh, and her, she herself, she has a, um, a, a little farm of ducks, which, which helps her uh, not only to support her family, but also to bribe other people, as we see, because uh, whenever one of the ducks falls because it's too crowded and the other ducks walk over her, uh, she takes it and gives it to somebody, uh, pretending that, you know, it's like a present, um, even though this duck is not in a very good shape. Um, but as she said, I'm not going to eat it. So, you know, it's okay. I can give it to somebody else. So she's obviously not a, the best person, but she's not as mean. Um, she just probably likes the power. Uh, that she has, she enjoys it and takes advantage of it, but she is not as cynical uh, as other people. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, okay, her husband in the end uh, almost cheats on her, but we could see a few scenes earlier that she was almost ready to do the same uh, with the militia men. So, uh, well, maybe she will find her happiness after the divorce with that gentleman. Uh, and everybody will be happy because obviously we do have a happy ending here. Uh, the the couple, the young couple, um, as I mentioned before, kind of revolts against the the old traditions and the, the their parents, and they decide that they're just gonna you know take their lives in their own hands and decide for themselves if they want to get divorced or not. Uh, and yeah, and they are. Um, 
different. They're trying to be different uh, than um, their, their parents or the generation uh, of their parents. Because the boy, he actually uh, mentions that he never had a house. Uh, so he he actually liked the place a lot, even though the mother is very despotic. Uh, he seems to find the, a home for the first time in his life, and that also helps him to decide to, that he wants to actually stay. Um, okay, so let's see um, the questions here. Uh, the first one is, is there any cultural significance to setting the movie in Silesia? Exem example, regional stereotypes, Silesia being part of the new recovered territor territories. Um, well, there is a little bit um, that's very hard to hear, <laughs> uh, ev see even more. Uh, the, the husband of the, um, the, the woman, the protagonist, uh, he speaks with a very specific accent. For, for Polish people, when they watch it, it's obvious that he, goes, uh, he comes from the eastern parts. Now, this is all happening outside Wrocław, exactly. Uh, and uh, Wrocław become a uh, new Lwów, or Lviv, uh, or Lwów in Polish, or Lemberg in German, a city of many names. Uh, this city is now in Ukraine, uh, quite, quite close to the Polish border, but before the war, it was in Poland, it was a Polish city, one of the academic cities with a lot of uh, educated people. And uh, after the war, because it became uh, Russian, well, it was a Ukrainian uh, socialist republic, but it was really part of the so Soviet Russia, uh, a lot of people decided to, to leave. And most of the people who lived in Lwów moved actually to Wrocław. Wrocław became the new Lwów. They even brought one of the monuments, like they, they re-erected the same monument um, uh, there. Um, so it, in a way, you know, it, they took over the, they had to move out from the, from the east, but they took over the lands that were uh, left by the Germans after the, they lost the Second uh, World War. So yeah, they were so-called recovered territories in a sense that we, we got them back Again, it's very complicated. Um, you know, if you're a country in Europe like England, and you're an island, your uh, borders don't change as much as if you are a mainland uh, country. Poland, uh, there was a time when it was starting in the Baltic Sea and finishing at the Black Sea. Uh, together with Lithuania, a commonwealth, it was quite big. There, but they didn't have Gdańsk, for example, then, they, then we had Gdańsk. So it keeps on moving up and down, south and east, uh, south and north, east and west. Uh, so it's really hard to, to say, uh, you know, where Poland exactly uh, is. Then there was the time of partitions uh, when Poland didn't exist for over 100 years and was divided between three countries. Uh, the Prussian um, Empire back then, which is Germany now, the Russian, and um, uh, Austro-Hungarian, Hamburg, <laughs> oh my God, okay. Hungarian, Austro-Hungarian, um, and that was uh, the, the the part, the south part. Uh, right now, obviously, we have the the borders that we've got from uh, nine, after 1945, uh, and uh, uh, the the cultural significance uh, will be that every uh, every um, part of the different patrician would have some differences in between. So what I'm trying to say by that was that the um, Austro-Hungarian Empire, which was at the south, as I mentioned, was like the poorest. The Russian was not great either. The German was the best off. So because people, uh, Polish people were divided for, for a long time between those three countries, they actually have a little bit different mentality. So now when the Poland is reunited, we see those differences. There are differences obviously in the, in the language, as I mentioned. Uh, it could be just the dialect, the accent, but also some little words. Um, so we do have a, a Polish language, a, a specific uh, general Polish language used by um, uh, you know, people on TV and uh, radio. 
but like in every country, uh, we also have um, some other uh, dialects. And there is a saying that the language, the proper or official language, is a dialect with power and money behind it. So like a dialect that won the fight between all of them. Uh, England is a very good example of similar situation. They say every 50 miles you have a different accent. So maybe in Poland is a little bit more than that. Poland is bigger as well. But we do have uh, different um, dialects and also different minorities. In Silesia, it was um, Polish German minorities. In Kashubian part of Poland, also Polish Germans called Kashubians. And they all had their own uh, languages. Poland was a melting pot before the world, uh, Second World War, which seems um, uh, almost impossible now when we look at it because now it's almost all uh, a white Catholic uh, um, Polish people. Uh, but it was actually, uh, it's only lately really because the case centuries ago was that Polish was, Poland was always um, a place when a lot of minorities would live and they would live next to each other, you know, in peace. Um, and there was even time during the um, uh, Reformation or Contra-Reformations um, when um, people would be in Europe persecuted because of their religion uh, or religious beliefs. I in Poland, that was not the case. We were so-called religious heaven uh, and we welcomed everyone. And uh, we also had the Jewish people coming, uh, as you might know already, obviously. Uh, and the, yeah, everybody could keep their own faith, even though um, main um, national kind of religion was, was Catholicism. But it was uh, really um, a little bit more than half of the population that would be the white Polish Catholic. So we used to live uh, uh, fine uh, with each other until somebody like Germans or Russians would come and then start you know, uh, uh, making problems uh, in between. They, especially with Ukrainians, that was the case. Um, there was um, some problems about Ukrainians uh, and Polish connection relations because um, we would at first actually uh, annex Ukrainian parts and there was no Ukrainian country. It was actually only the Ukrainian Republic that kind of uh, um, was a source of, of the Ukrainian country that we have now. And in Ukraine, they would have um, either pro-Polish or pro-Russian sentiments that would change depending on what's happening. Uh, right now, I think they rather pro-Polish because we are uh, um, symbolizing for them uh, European Union. Uh, we, they are now the border of the European Union with us. That's where the European Union finishes. Uh, so, yeah, Polish people are, are actually mm, supporting uh, their fight for independence uh, and, and they supported the um, Orange Revolution uh, that was happening in, in, in Ukraine. Obviously, now the situation is completely different. Okay, I don't know how I got into Ukraine, but <laughs> let's go back to the questions. Could you please say something more about traditional um, wedding uh, customs? Yes, uh, Polish wedding, that's a, a te uh, subject, a uh, uh, big subject. And you see some of them here uh, in the film. So when the um, uh, married couple comes uh, and they didn't get the uh, wedding in the church, which is the tradition, because obviously the mother wouldn't allow it, they only had the civil marriage. Uh, so that means they went to the office and, and signed the papers, which made them legally. Uh, married, but after that they would follow all the traditions. So when they come, there is a bread that they kiss. The bread also has some salt and there's champagne. Uh, now in this film they didn't show it, maybe in this part of uh, Poland they, they didn't do it, but normally the couple would drink the first um, glass of champagne and then throw the glass and it should break. That would be good luck. So again, different uh, parts of Poland will have a little bit different customs, um, but that's quite uh, popular, especially the, the bread. And kissing the bread just shows the respect of a daily bread. So it's all very Catholic, really. So this lady, the protagonist of the film, follows all those traditions, even though uh, they are uh, religious in a way, but they became part of national traditions 
uh, and that's why you know she's probably following them even though she is a, a communist who doesn't go to church at all she doesn't even want her uh, daughter to go and there is a scene when she catch, uh, catches her right before she gets to the church and she said don't go because it's like you know again the reputation you bring in shame on me by by going to church so uh, the other thing is that if you had a wedding usually the mother of the bride or the parents of the bride would, would pay for it so that was the case obviously in this film but for re different reasons but you would always show off a polish wedding lasts uh, well at least one night overnight with a lot of food and a lot of drinking you have to provide vodka and it has to be enough uh, it has a lot of drinking dancing singing uh, and kissing, we saw that scene, that's very traditional as well. The guests will start uh, shouting that the vodka is bitter and the, the, uh, the new married couple has to make it sweeter. And to make it sweeter, they have to kiss. And then everybody is happy, they drink, and that repeats itself over and over a whole night. So sometimes, and especially in Latin villages outside the city, a wedding can take even two nights and one day in between because the next day it's the so-called popravine, which means kind of trying to make the same thing again, even better. So uh, again, you start by drinking, uh, dancing uh, and eating a lot. Now eating something fat like a duck helps uh, because if you eat something before you start drinking vodka, then you don't get drunk as easily. Uh, but obviously the goal is to, to, do, to get drunk. Uh, Poland was famous, like all uh, Soviet countries, for, um, uh, well, love for vodka uh, and also alcohol problem, of course. It came from uh, uh, Russia, in my opinion. I also read a book in which uh, Alcohol uh, drinking is mm, attached to different regions of Europe. So for example, um, the explanation was that the Mediterranean countries would uh, drink wine. Uh, people in uh, more north, like Germany and around, would rather drink um, beer and uh, people to the west would drink vodka. So back in communist times, vodka was very popular. It was a problem because um, yeah, many people would drink. You, you very often would do business by drinking a, a bottle of vodka. People would drink at work. It was, a, it was a real problem. I think what happened uh, with the change of the system, and some people might not uh, agree with me, but I think we became more beer country. We, we became very um, um, Irish. We love uh, St. Patrick's Day. Uh, even though we don't have parades because we just don't have parades in general, so we don't have a parade for St. Patrick. But yeah, I think people now would rather drink beer, uh, but vodka is still uh, very popular. If you have a wedding though, you do have to have a lot, a lot of bottles of vodka there. Uh, but I think the stereotype of Polish people drinking vodka is uh, not true anymore, in my opinion. Not that, I'm not saying that completely not true, uh, but yeah, uh, rather for like big occasions. Every day is more a, a beer um, drank than, than vodka itself. Uh, so uh, that was another thing about the wedding. Let me think what else uh, was there. The general thing again of the reputation uh, showing off, especially in the case of this lady, she was a, a party member uh, and she, you know, uh, really wanted to prove that she has it all. Uh, and that's why she, the, the husband even was saying, don't you think it's enough uh, to two pigs and so many ducks and so many bottle of vodka, they will not be able to eat it and drink it all. Uh, but she says, uh, uh, no, this is, you know, this is exactly what we need. So they prefer to have some food left probably after uh, than not enough. Uh, let's have a look at the other question. Uh, could you mention something more about the, the Pope and the, um, uh, the first pilgrimage to Poland? Yes, so, um, and some people, while I was talking about it before the film, was writing in the, in the chat. So yeah, um, uh, the, the uh, first Polish Pope ever 
um, John Paul II was really called uh, Karol Voltyła. So that's why I think one person here said Karol is now a famous name. So I don't have to explain the Oh Karol title. We know it's a masculine name, obviously different Karol. Um, so he first came to Poland in 1979. Uh, uh, that was the uh, official pilgrimage as a, as a Pope. And as I mentioned before, that helped uh, people to, um, in a way, that was the starting point of, of solidarity because people would uh, uh, get together and, and see how many of them are, uh, well, against the system because they obviously would show that they are uh, Catholics, that they are religious. Remember, you have, to, you have to remember that the communism was treated by most of Polish people as something imposed uh, by Russians and not just Polish people. I think a lot of Soviet countries felt the same. That was that why there was so many jokes about the Russians. So even though Russian people would suffer as much, um, they had this opinion that it is a, like a Russian uh, uh, ideas uh, that that are brought together with communism. Now, obviously, that was not exactly the case. Um, and there was actually uh, a lot of examples of real friendship between, between Polish and Russian people. Uh, it was more the governments of both countries that had more in common with each other than, uh, than Russian people with their government, which they were fighting against eventually as well. So, um, yeah, where was I? <laughs> uh, so yes, the, the, the Pope uh, coming uh, would prove to, Pol to Polish people that uh, they need to fight against the Russian system again. And that would, for, for Polish people, seem like just something, uh, not, I don't want to say normal, but something that they've been through before, right? So it's like the, this over and over, um, happening over and over. So, and, and communism in the end uh, was uh, not as long as the patrician, for example, right? So in the end, it, it was just one of those things. And I think that also shows in a film we watched yesterday, uh, the tradition uh, that uh, Barea talks about in the film a lot. I think it, this tradition was symbolizing that yes, communism was imposed from outside, but it's just a matter of time and all we have to do, I mean, it will pass like everything else. Uh, and we just have to stick with to our traditions and uh, you know our um, nationality in a way and language and culture and, and things like that. Um, okay, let's look at the at the next uh, question. Who was the statue in the greenhouse? Oh yeah, uh, the greenhouse uh, had a statue of the uh, Marszałek Józef Piłsudski. Um, Marszałek Józef Piłsudski was in power between the wars. I did mention him a little bit yesterday. There was a lot of people who would um, worship him, let's say. Uh, this gentleman, the, the husband of the protagonist, he is um, growing different flowers and he even calls one of, one of the roses uh, Marshall for the Marszałek uh, Piłsudski, for, for, for him, for this person who is in the, in the statue. Now, why is it in the greenhouse? Uh, Piłsudski was not very well uh, seen by the uh, communist uh, authorities because for them he represented, um, well, the free Poland, first of all, uh, but also democratic uh, Poland, uh, because even though he was uh, having authoritarian um, ideas uh, and, um, he, he would try, well, he, there was a coup d'etat between the wars, but it was actually still quite democratic um, and he never really took over uh, the power. He, he rather cooperated with the government. So it was not as, uh, as bad as in other countries uh, with, I don't know, Hitler, Mussolini uh, or, or, or Stalin, right? That who would accumulate all power. So uh, some people uh, loved him and worshipped him, probably also because um, he was the symbol of the uh, Polish independence after over 100 years of patricians. 
Um, he was the one who came back uh, in 1918 to Poland and uh, took uh, over, uh, you know, and um, he, he, was, he was symbolizing that, that moment uh, in a way for, for a lot of people. Um, but you wouldn't uh, be really, uh, especially if you were a husband of a, of a village party leader and um, leader of the village itself, uh, you wouldn't uh, keep him outside. I mean, she probably never would let him. Uh, he should be happy she let him keep him in the greenhouse. So for him, it was probably uh, just a reminder as well of that time before the war where Eastern parts, where his family is most likely, likely from, uh, you know, when that existed. So it would be something very uh, personal in a way. He mentioned his father, who actually uh, start growing those roses and call them Marshawek, Marshall. So I'm guessing uh, his father also uh, uh, was the um, uh, Piłsudski fan uh, and he probably took it over uh, from him. So uh, there was nothing funny about that statue, I would say, but it was a symbol uh, as well of this uh, hypocrisy that we have everywhere in the film that outside you, you show and talk and believe, let's say, in one thing, and then uh, inside, hidden, uh, you do different things, which was exactly the case with that family. They would pretend outside everything is fine, why inside there was a lot of problems. That was this schizophrenic situation in Polish uh, families in general that I mentioned before. Uh, we kind of knew uh, it wasn't always about the re reputation. It was more about what you knew uh, you can say outside and what is allowed and what you can't, what you have to hide. And I think that comes from the patricians' time already as well, partitions, uh, because uh, back then the Polish language was forbidden, uh, but people would still speak Polish at home and this way the language didn't die, right? So uh, you would not speak Polish in, at school, or in offices of either Russian Empire or, or Prussian or, or Austro-Hungarian, uh, but you would still do it uh, at home. And later in communist times, you will, that would mean, um, and I'm, I might talk from experience right now as well, for example, uh, one, members, uh, one person from my family, member of my family was killed in Katyn massacre, uh, which we were uh, not allowed to talk about because or mention that we know Russians did it. it. We didn't learn about it at school at all. It was not mentioned at the history school. And I would never, you know, say, oh, uh, what about this? Why are we not learning about it? I, I knew I'm not supposed to um, talk about it outside. Uh, the Katyn massacre was, um, happened at the beginning of the war when uh, after Germans uh, attacked Poland 17 days later, uh, Russians did as well from the east and they met in the middle and then they would uh, the Russians would kill the Polish intelligentsia doctors teachers uh, everybody educated and uh, soldiers as well generals uh, and you know everybody of high rank because they knew that it's easier to um, govern people who are not educated so they would just leave the ones who can just just work for them right uh, so cutting massacre was discovered after the war but because that part of, of Europe was being taken over by Germans, then Russians, then Germans, then Russians, you know, it was going back and forth. Well, actually it was first Russians, then Germans, then Russians. Uh, that's why the Russians say it was the Germans who did it. Uh, and uh, that was the official uh, version for a long time in Poland. So we knew the truth, but we were not um, supposed to say it uh, loud. We could get, get in trouble if we said, that we know it was the Russians. It was only after the change of the system that it was proved. And uh, of also it took like 50 years, you know, for, for some documents to be released. And um, yeah, we know now for sure uh, that it was the Russians who, who did it. Um, but that was this part of the schizophrenic mentality that you would be a different persona outside and a different persona inside. And um, there is this psychology idea that we all do that in a way. Uh, so it's not 
such or that unusual. So you imagine if you, for example, at work, uh, you talk differently to your work colleagues and then if your mom calls you on the phone, that's the most uh, common example, that you will speak to her differently that you talk to your uh, work colleagues, even your voice might change a little bit. So this is exactly the same idea that you have two personas or more personas, depending on who you um, actually have a, a social uh, relationship with or contact at the moment. Uh, but for us, it meant that you need to know what you are allowed to say or not, because, you know, uh, for, for the wrong things, if you said the wrong things, you could actually uh, end up even in jail uh, as, a, as, a, as a spy, for example. doesn't matter as what, you know, if, if there is a, a, as they would always say in communism, give me a man and I will find a, a paragraph for him. I will find the crime, you know, to blame him. Uh, so that was not a problem. So you could be blame of something completely different. Obviously, they couldn't blame you that you said something that was true, but you were not supposed to say it loud. Um, do, do you have any more questions? Uh, because right now, this was, this is it that I can, so far I can see. Please remember, you can also use the chat. This is your last chance now, I think, to ask the question. <laughs> Otherwise, um, uh, you know, I need, I need a subject, I need something to start, and then if you give me uh, something, I can, I can talk about it for longer, but otherwise I'm missing this spark uh, to start the, the fire. <laughs> well, it looks like that's it. Oh, there is one, okay, as I said, last minute, last call, we could say. Do you see any symbolism in the, in the partner not getting his come happens at the end of the movie. Um, I'm not sure what that word means. I'm sorry. This is the first time that I see it. I'm, I'm guessing you're talking about the two uh, criminals. Well, well, as we find out, the, the boyfriend, he was not really a killer or, or thief. Uh, he went to jail just because, you know, they tried to make a deal and that didn't work. So is that about those two gentlemen? A punishment uh, or fate that someone deserves. So by, by, by the partner, uh, do you mean the boyfriend? I'm sorry, I'm having a conversation now. Yeah, it's about the two gentlemen, the broker. So, well, yeah, the gentleman who, who actually finds the boy, right? And then tells him, you have to do it because you own me uh, 20,000, so half of the 40,000 that he's supposed to get. So the question is, do you see any symbolism in the partner not getting his uh, fate, punishment at the end of the movie? Um, I'm not sure if I see the symbolism. To be honest, uh, it, did, it wasn't shown. So you might have different opinion, but I would have thought that he will get his money. Uh, he will at least get the money from the boy. The boy, well, let's call him the boy, the boyfriend. He already said that he's not going to take the money himself, but he will probably be paid and then the, the boyfriend will not be owing him uh, anything. Uh, but yeah, there is no puni punishment here because it's a comedy. Uh, there is a happy ending, uh, you know, so they didn't want to... Uh, spoil it with, with everything, but he he didn't make any crime really in the end. He he helped them in a way, right? He didn't steal from them. I think this is also kind of shown that that's not gonna happen anymore. He's not gonna steal now from his friend's house, right? So I'm just guessing that he will be paid. Um, they will probably keep uh, the deal, uh, so he will get his part. And that will also make his friend uh, not, you know, owning him uh, anymore. So I hope that answered that question. <laughs> question, I'm not sure, uh, but yeah, this is how I see it. Now, it, it doesn't mean I know um, all the answers to everything. Every film, every every form of art, after it's finished, can be read different ways, and you know, there is no one. Uh, mm, on the one and only uh, correct way uh, uh, of, of reading everything. Uh, yeah, uh, what I'm trying to say is to give you some facts about the things that are in the film that I can surely talk about, but the meaning of some things, 
in the film uh, are up to everybody, so you can decide for, for yourself what happens after. Uh, there is another question in the chat now. Will be recordings of these meetings available after? Yes, we are recording um, all of them. Uh, we do have to edit them because we record the whole three hours and part of it, as you know, is just a slide um, about the retrospective. So we have to cut it off. Um, so yeah, that, that will be done and you will get an email when, when they are ready. Uh, after the retrospective is over, uh, most likely, uh, yeah, we will send you the information when you can watch them. Okay, so uh, if there are no more questions, then let me just quickly talk a little bit about tomorrow and after tomorrow, our last two films. Um, they will be a little bit different again from this one. That was already an example of something lighter uh, than Barea or even Pivovsky's films. So everything that we watched up to now because the other ones were uh, more uh, symbolic. There was a lot of symbolism. There was a lot of uh, jokes that were very quick, uh, based on sometimes on historical uh, events, uh, sometimes very intelligent and uh, hard to follow. Uh, now here you had an example of something much simple. The story is simple. Uh, it's a love story in a way, a twisted uh, communist uh, rom-com. Um, so it was a little bit, uh, you know, uh, different already. But what is ahead of us, um, and I am personally a big fan of Machulski, as a lot of people in Poland, he made a lot of uh, cult films. We cannot show them all, but also those two are really the ones about the system and the other ones not necessary, like uh, between the war times or, or the times after the system changed. So those two are the good examples of uh, satire of, on the um, totalitarian state. So there will be no, um, no more Polish reality in them, as I mentioned before. One is a science fiction, that's tomorrow's exhibition about the world without men. And the other one is King's Eyes about dwarves. Um, so they are using, in one case, science fiction, in the other, uh, the fairy tale, uh, but they are still, again, symbolizing Poland by, without showing it. So Polish uh, audience would know that all those jokes are um, addressed at the, at the totalitarian system. But at the same time, the censors couldn't do anything really because, you know, they didn't maybe realize or they had nothing really to say. They had like a list of things that you are not allowed to say or show, right? And that didn't... Uh, it wasn't really working with those kind of film, films. So here we don't as much, we'll see a Sopian language as a completely uh, different way of doing things by using the costume. So he wouldn't show the reality and this way he could pretend it's not about Poland, but everybody knew it is. So I really recommend those two films. They are very Hollywood-like. And um, I hope that you will find time to watch them tomorrow at uh, 6 and Saturday at uh, 1 p.m. Uh, thank you very much for tonight. It was a great pleasure for me. And I hope that you will come back again. Thank you. Have a good evening.